Hello, everyone. Welcome to SPAC Chat. I'm Karen Snow, head of East Coast Listings at NASDAQ, and it's my great pleasure to be speaking with Harry Sloan and Eli Baker, Serial SPAC sponsors. Harry and Eli have partnered since 2014, issuing six SPACs and completing five business combinations together, including DraftKings, Skills, and Will Scott. Harry, Eli, what an incredible partnership, and we're so thrilled to have you here with us today. Thanks for being here. So uh, why don't you both give us a little bit of um, perspective on your backgrounds uh, and what it is that you think makes uh, e Eagle Equity Partners so successful? I think, the, I think the background really does have a lot to do with it. When we did it, when Jeff and I did our first SPAC back in 2011, all the SPACs were being done by financial generalists and by financial players. Uh, my background and his was in the entertainment media industry. Uh, most recently, I'd run MGM Studios and uh, uh, in Hollywood, and before that, I'd build a TV and radio and cable network uh, broadcast group in Europe. Very diverse background uh, in very many parts of the world. And Jeff had run CBS Network in the U.S., so basically we were TV, movie, entertainment guys during the digital transition. And during that transition, of course, there were opportunities to IPO companies. And what we brought to the table was, and when we raised our first SPAC, we said, you know, specifically, you know, we're looking for either traditional media assets like, like cable or television, but in high growth markets outside the U.S. If it was going to be in the U.S., it had to be in those days what we'd call a digital media asset. So we differentiated ourselves. We said, here's exactly what we're looking for. And by the way, the first deal we did was a digital media asset. It was a Wi-Fi to the airlines, and that was in 2011. The second deal we did was traditional media in a high growth market. It was cable TV, uh, sorry, satellite TV in India. My background was originally as a lawyer a long time ago, and then uh, working at several different hedge funds, especially in special opportunity situations. And I think there's no better way to describe, I think, SPACs than special opportunities, right? Which is exactly what it is. And I think it's kind of the combined basis, especially, you know, Harry and Jeff picking a lane that they very much knew and were successful in it in executing its SPACs early on, which gave us quite an advantage, frankly, of knowing like how SPACs work. And that in being in front of this pack of 482 or 500, I forget the count today, um, has really been, I think, the secret sauce in learning all the dynamics and all the attributes of a SPAC so that we know what targets can work and what won't and where to spend our time. Yeah, I think that's really true. Com really, you're combining that uh, investor background, legal, there's a big legal component, and then, of course, the operating. And I think if you look at the performance of SPAC sponsors, um, you you've got the secrets off. So let's move on to targets. Um, Harry, mind spending a little bit of time on what it is that you look for in a target? All right, sure. Um, first of all, a good IPO, uh, which I define as a, a stock which will double within three years. I think if we believe that that's the base case, I think that's the gating issue for, for any IPO. So it has to be a good IPO to begin with. Now, you know, you read a lot of people that may be getting overly exuberant and saying that SPAC is always better or a better vehicle than regular way IPO. And maybe in some ways it is. But one thing we look for and this may just be more about us, is we look for companies that probably wouldn't go regular way IPO, or at least, you know, there's a really has to be a reason to go SPAC. So for example, um, DraftKings, which is, you know, maybe, maybe one of the more famous ones. DraftKings couldn't go public regular way because DraftKings strategy was to merge with their tech supplier, which is SP Tech. And in a regular way IPO, you cannot, take two companies public at the same time. It'll take you a year. You have to have consolidated financials. You have to actually put the companies together. You have to show synergies because the investors are skeptical about them. So it's a year process. Whereas with a SPAC, because we're already public, we've already done our IPO, we acquired DraftKings and SB Tech together, and the rest is history. Um, with skills, uh, we SPAC was the, was the right route for skills because skills wasn't a brand name. It wasn't a name that people were familiar with, uh, unlike DraftKings. We needed to have 150 investor meetings. You can't really do that in regular way IPO because you're on a tight schedule. So we, 
it was a, a platform like no other. There are no comps to what skills does. By the way, there's no comps to what drafting does. And when there's no comps, the SPAC again is a better vehicle, probably the only vehicle, because you need to take time to work with the investors so that they understand the valuation. The SPAC process is terrific for that. Again, particularly with companies that don't have comps. You got comps, you say, okay, look, the comps are trading at 10 and we're bringing this deal out at eight. And that's what the story is about valuation. And that wasn't the case with skills, wasn't the case with DraftKings, thus the SPAC made more sense. We're, we will not be looking for a deal that's just perfect, or should be going regular way, but for some reason that's not provable to us, wants to use the SPAC. Yeah, that's interesting. That was going to be one of my questions a little bit later about you know, how you convince companies that are you know, planning to, to do an IPO that they should really be doing a, a SPAC. Um, but that, that really answers it right there. So Eli, can you talk a little bit about um, how a target should be thinking about evaluating a sponsor? What are the things that they should be um, considering? Well, it, it's interesting kind of where we've come from and where we are now, right? And this process has evolved. And several years ago, I would say probably into even last year, you know, after DraftKings and a slate of, you know, really highly successful SPAC IPOs, um, we, Harry and I have this, we have this speech we call the howling at the moon speech, where we were howling at the moon, trying to convince, you know, premier sponsors and owners of companies to take their companies public through SPAC. And that was a very, you know, challenging thing to do, um, whether it was management driven or management owned, or it was, you know, sponsorship or private equity owned. And obviously we made the breakthrough last year, not just us with DraftKings, but beyond that. And so now um, it's kind of a very different group of targets out there that are looking to SPAC. It used to be SPAC, companies would go through a SPAC if they wanted to access public markets, but they probably didn't have too many other choices or they had to go through a SPAC because a, a regular way IPO wouldn't work just like Harry was describing. You know, now there's a mix of companies who probably could IPO on their own. By the way, skills could have, but they selected to go through a SPAC because it was faster, it was easier, and they could have a more bespoke process. And so I think targets now have to think about kind of where they sit in that spectrum. And I think that when they look, obviously they have to look into size, right? Which is how much money they need. Um, they need to look at how much float is gonna be out there because it's not just about getting public, it's about succeeding once you are. Um, and I think the SPAC sponsor matters a lot because I know that when, when targets talk to us, you know, they know that we're going to be bringing, let's call it a following with us, right? And that means institutional investors, first and foremost, because that's the most important, but also even a retail following, right? Knowing that we are the guys who've done DraftKings, we're the guys who've done skills. And I think that there's a lot of built-in advantage to that. And I think when targets are looking at taking their pub company public, and by the way, that's nearest and dearest to their hearts and execution has to be perfect. I think it's, it's knowing the sponsors who have that track record in the public markets. It's knowing that they're going to focus on their story and not be doing too many of these things at once and making sure they succeed because you know every moment of it counts all the way from the beginning of the process to once you get public. DraftKings value was based on how fast 40 or 50 states would allow sports betting. And particularly big states like New York and Texas and California and Florida, they still haven't. So the investors had to be able to make a, a prediction about how fast 10 states, 20 states, 40 states would allow sports betting to be able to tell how big the TAM and how big is the business. And that could only be done by the company initially putting out you know, a long range um, model, which you, again, you do not do in a regular way IPO, you, or at least you should not. So Harry, having been at this you know, over 10 years now, um, I'd really love to hear your thoughts on the, the SPAC market currently um, and where we're going to go from here. The question that gets posed is, are we in a SPAC bubble? And I don't think that's the right question. I think the question is, does the fact that we have 586 SPACs, ridiculous number, $150, $200 billion going into SPAC, also ridiculous number, does that tell us that we're getting toward the end of a cycle? Is that a sign? That this is kind of, I mean, that is, it is crazy. There is no reason to have 586 SPACs right there. People end up in SPAC ops where, you know, 10 companies or 10 SPACs are chasing the same IPO and, and they're chasing it by competing with each other by putting unrealistic valuations on the table. Um, so that's just, that, that to me feels like a symptom that the market may be getting 
you know, toppy. And that maybe is where the bubble is. So uh, as far as the future is concerned, you know, we have too many SPACs. So the future of SPACs will be, will be less. Um, the future of SPACs, I think, will be clearly understanding why it, this company needed to go SPAC, not, hey, we're doing a regular way IPO, but let's just rush it and go into a SPAC. That feels artificial to me. It feels like it's not worthy of, of the you know, Wall Street community to be able to do business that way. How fast can we just shove something into a SPAC? Doesn't, it, it, it belies what we think is part of the reason for a SPAC is being able to take the time to work with investors and understand valuation. So I'm, I'm speaking you know, maybe too long. Bottom line for me is SPAC is, is not a bubble. It will continue to exist. Um, it's just I think there'll be fewer issuers as there should be. Yeah. Eli, before we uh, sign off here, any final words of wisdom for the audience? I was going to say one, two things. Is one is also on the subject of whether or not you know SPACs are here to stay. Or is it a bubble? It, there's a lot of statistics that kind of fly out there about what percentage of IPOs are now SPACs, right? But I think that the market has that completely wrong, right? Comparing a SPAC IPO, which is akin to raising a fund, right, with that right of redemption that I think everybody knows about. That's not really comparable to an IPO, which is taking a company out to the markets, right? The, the, the real comparison apples to apples is regular way IPOs side by side with um, the DSPAC process, right? When a company finds a target and announces it to the world. That's what I think investors should be looking at when thinking about, right, how SPACs are faring and then how those SPACs are, are, are really performing. Um, but I think, uh, you know, answering your question, last thoughts is I, I do think that SPACs are here to stay. Um, I think that there are some inherent advantages that SPACs have, and I think that they're, they're really terrific, right? They have allowed a lot of companies to be able to reach the public markets, allowing um, a lot of either institutional or retail investors to invest in certain companies they wouldn't have access to otherwise that have been kind of domain of just private opportunities. And I think it's great. I think that SPACs aren't perfect, but neither are IPOs. Um, but obviously we're, we're a little bit biased, but we're big fans. And I, and I think it actually is a great product um, that will continue to learn itself as it goes. I was on a panel um, that the FT Financial Times had on mergers and acquisitions. And the other panelists before me said, my God, look what's going on. All this SPAC activity, 80 billion here, 100 billion here, 500 specs. And, and you know, I, it came around to me and I said, so what? That doesn't matter. I mean, it doesn't mean anything. The fact everybody has a SPAC now. If everybody has a SPAC, what does it mean? I guess it means that investors are putting some of their money in, that might have gone to PE or might have gone to public equity or might have gone to, to venture capital. They're giving it to me or they're giving it to, you know, Michael Klein or somebody else. But everybody has got a SPAC. And if everybody's doing it, you got to question whether there's anything really happening. And nothing is happening until the de-SPAC process. This was a panel on M&A. Raising a SPAC is not M&A. Raising a SPAC does not you know, indicate that M&A is booming. What indicates that <laughs> M&A is booming is mergers and IPOs that get done, which is the DSPAC process. And yes, there's more IPOs getting done. Why is there more IPOs getting done? There's more IPOs getting done because there's probably half as many stocks on NASDAQ and New York Stock Exchange today as there were 10, 15 years ago. T. Rowe and Capital Group and the big mutual funds, they need more stocks. And the stock market is, 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 so, is high now. It's giving a very high values. The companies, rather than do a late stage right private deal, they go public. That's what's going on. Neither of those have anything to do with SPACs. Yeah, I've been saying it's really, it's a 10-year backlog that we've all been waiting for, right? SPACs are helping unlock all of that. So it's such an honor to have you both with us today. And on behalf of everyone at NASDAQ, we wish you continued success. And that's it for SPAC Chat. See you next time.